Good evening, a warm welcome to all of you to the webinar series hosted by Advocates Association Bengaluru. We have with us today Mrs. Lakshmi Iyengar, Senior Advocate, High Court of Karnataka. Ma'am, we are happy to have you with us. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you. With immense pleasure, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Mrs. Lakshmi Iyengar, who holds a BA in Journalism and a Law degree, has also obtained a Diploma in Human Rights Law and Diploma in Sports Law. She has over 22 years of practice in the High Court of Karnataka and the Supreme Court of India. She has represented the Karnataka State Legislative Assembly Secretariat before the High Court of Karnataka. She has also appeared as an official liquidator before the Fugitive Economic Offences Court and PMLA Court to protect the rights of the creditors in the UB matter. Mrs. Ayanga predominantly appears before the NCLT, NC. L80 with respect to the company matters. She has also taken the rights of the middle class citizens in Bangalore all the way up to the Supreme Court to stop indiscriminate demolition of their houses. She also takes the credit of seeking a direction against the BBMP to have speed breakers near the school zones. It was Mrs. Lakshmi uh, who moved the court to protect the women by implementing uh, the safety procedure, removal of locking system in taxis and cab. Apart from legal profession, Mrs. Lakshmi has keen interest in sports and she has represented Karnataka State in basketball tournament. She's also represented Karnataka State in cricket and was chosen as the South Zone wicket keeper at junior level. She's won the national go-karting championship, so we have the right person to talk on sports law today. Ma'am, on behalf of Advocates Association Bengaluru, I extend a warm welcome to you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. The topic today is sports law. Sports law sounds generic. Well, there are no specific legislations, unfortunately, for me to attempt a dissection. Sports law, as opposed to other branches of law, has not evolved into specific legislation as yet. It is still at its infancy. Some countries have enacted sports development acts which have more to do with the promotion and development of sports in their country rather than an all-encompassing code. There exists no substantive sports law in many jurisdictions and the law governing the sports arises out of the rules and regulations made by the respective sports federations, both state and national. FIFA governs football at a global level with its disciplinary courts, as does ICC, the International Cricket Council, with respect to cricket. Before we go into the various facets of sports law in India particularly, we would touch upon some of the present disputes and rulings in the field of world sports just to have an idea. Manchester City, one of the top football clubs in England, was called up by UEFA, that is the European Federation, for the contravention of financial fair play regulations. Now these regulations have been found necessary so as to ensure that football clubs do not spend more than what they earn. To protect the survival of sports, it's essential that a club does not go out of its way to get the most expensive players to sign up, thereby spending more than what they can afford. So it was the case that Manchester City, owned by an Abu Dhabi United group, manipulated their books in a manner to show income as sponsorships so as to purchase expensive players, though allegedly the income seemed to be coming in through the owner's pocket. Now, Manchester City was banned from UEFA Champions League for about two years, which came up in appeal before the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Now, the Court of Arbitration for Sports is a quasi-judicial body headquartered in Switzerland. It was established by the International Olympic Association and that changed with the Paris Agreement, wherein the agreement related to the constitution of an International Council for Arbitration for Sports, and it was mooted that there should be a CAS, and this acquired an independent status. Now, the CAS has been given distinct roles. One is to resolve disputes, which is referred to ordinary arbitration, which if you have in an arbitration clause. The other is if appeals on arbitration that come out of decisions of the federations or associations or any sport related bodies, wherein those bodies have their own mechanisms and on appeals over that it comes to the CAS. 
also the cas gives non binding advisory opinions now in the manchester city uh, ban case the cas held that some of the breaches were not established and some were time barred now the they just ordered a uh, fine of about 10 million you know, euros to be paid to the uefa and uh, they permitted the club to take part in the uefa club competitions Now the jurisdiction of the courts can be determined on the basis of the nature of claim involved. In the event that there is a dispute between player and the club for issues relating to maybe wages or bonuses or sanctions, the jurisdictional courts, as provided in the contract while signing with the club, will have the jurisdiction. Um, for instance, the Neymar case. this was decided by the courts in barcelona this uh, ar- uh, this arose uh, because neymar wanted to shift from barcelona to psg and therefore barcelona claimed a certain amount as compensation which he had to pay and move the courts in barcelona it's another matter that it all came to be resolved with psg paying up barcelona subsequently but in the in the event of a dispute between a club and the parent association or the club being reprimanded by the disciplinary committee of the parent body for violations of their code or the applicable laws the disciplinary committee will decide on issues which can be appealed before the appellate committee so they have within themselves a disciplinary committee then an appellate committee and then it goes before the cas that's the corporate court of arbitration for sports as for the rules and regulations of the club or the federation for instance elsi football club it was decided wherein fifa disciplinary committee had passed an order as against them and even the appeal committee had passed an order against them and finally they went before the cas this was a case wherein the club was charged for breaking rules that protected youth players that is minors so they were handed over a one year ban on new registrations or signing of players or transfers so that would deprive them of two windows two windows meaning there are two transfer uh, windows open in a year so that's two windows so basically the cas allowed the appeal and thereby opening a window for a one and window opening meaning they only lost out on one so they were it was open for the uh, for the chelsea club to go ahead with the transfers now why i mention all of this is because of cas which is ultimately the authority for uh, for decisions in sports the cas recognized the discrimination meted out to female athletes contrary to the olympic charter in the case of duthi chand now she is a pride of india as all we uh, all of us know she had challenged her ban wherein she was banned from participating in the um, subsequent to the commonwealth uh, games where she had won two gold medals at uh, asian junior athletics in uh, in and around uh, 2014 she had won it in 200 meters and 400 meters now duthi chand is a lady she's a born a woman she's legally and physically considered all along fit to be in the female category but she had to endure an exhausting battle to sustain her rights as a sportswoman the issue she faced was specifically with respect to something called hyperandrogenism now this is basically excess androgens in the body now although the issue relating to transgenders what they face in sports are much more the issue with uh, uh, with uh, duthi was an issue wherein she had to go through several tests and then she was banned stating that there was excess hypoandrogenism but the ca panel decided in favor of uh, duthi chand and suspended the iaaf regulations now the in the, in the international context the international sports law is ultimately a by product of several private initiatives and it has acquired an international legal recognition through customary practices olympics is also ultimately a, a private initiative uh, which has come along through customary practices compliance by states and regional organization of the rules formulated by their international counterparts over the years has cemented the identity of international bodies now the immediate effect of the international sports law is on the athletes unlike other categories of international law like we all know wherein the subject is the state not sports federations international sports uh, sports federation like if governs individual sports in an international context 
Now, the disciplinary code rules and regulations formulated by these federations govern the individual sports and other ancillary, uh, ancillary issues or even doping concerns. The major international federations, some of them are FIFA or ICC or FIA, that's the Automobile Federation. Then the most recognized international sports organization is the International Olympic Committee. Now, the Olympic Committee, that is the IOC, works in association with the national Olympic committees representing each country in the Olympic movement like our IOA. The IOC is the final authority on the Olympic movement and the executive board of the IOC func functions like a legislature. It is the responsibility of the formulation of rules and regulations necessary for the implementation of the Olympic Charter. In association with international federations and organizations, IOC formulates the code of conduct for the Olympic events. Each sporting event is regulated by a federation or organization of its own, like the International Boxing Association. Now, disputes are settled in each federation by their own mechanism. So their own mode of resolution or disputes and a mechanism to appeal the decision of the adjudicating body. For instance, the sport of tennis is regulated by the bylaws and the rules formulated by International Tennis Federation, ITF. Now the tennis anti-corruption program set up by the ITF or to, mat in, uh, to hear with matters relating to corruption, all of this, it stipulates a procedure for conducting an adjudicatory hearing against covered persons and all of it. Now an appeal from this ultimately lies to the CAS, which is the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Similarly, International Basketball Federation, FIBA, recognizes Basketball Arbitral Tribunal under its general statutes at the body for settlement of disputes between players, agents, coaches, whatever. Now the method of adjudicating and the applicable laws depend on each federation to which each sporting event is affiliated and the governing rules of the general statute. The international adjudicating, uh, uh, the adjudication of disputes relating to sports recognize main two things. Two bodies are recognized. One is the CAS Court of Arbitration of Sports and the World Anti-Doping Agency. Now the CAS in particular, I will deal with it before we go on to the Indian relevance of all of it. The Court of Arbitration for Sports has gained significance, recognition and in the adjudicating and the appellate authority for major disputes, as seen in the case of FIFA or ITF, the IOC established the Court of the Arbitration, which has specialized knowledge in the field of sports. Initially, it was dependent on the IOC for funding, but later on after the agreement, it has its independent status. Now it's headquartered in Switzerland, and when an arbitration agreement is executed between two parties, the CAS is governed wherein they go by three divisions, ordinary arbitral division, anti-doping division, the appeal arbitration division. Apart from the ordinary and hearing of the divisions, the CAS stipulates an ad hoc division for urgent hearing matters during Olympic Games. So they have something set up exclusively at the Olympic Games location so that they could hear it on a day-to-day -day basis and complete the entire hearing. They also have, um, um, I think they have, besides in Switzerland, they have one hearing maybe in New York and one somewhere in Australia, I'm not too sure. So they have two, three locations and this is where the matters are heard. The decisions of the ad hoc, they're rendered within a short period of time, sometimes within 24 hours. So the landmark decisions for us would be the Duti Chand case, wherein they had recognized Duti Chand's case and suspended the IF regulations being discriminatory against female athletes. So Duti Chand had an opportunity to immediately start participating in sports again. Now, World Anti-Doping Agency, which is called WADA, basically they, they fight, the fight against the doping in sports is coordinated by WADA and it cooperates with the IOC, the National Olympic Committees, International Sports Federations and anti-doping organizations. Now, there are multiple anti-doping declarations that have come into effect with a common object to curb, do, curb doping in sporting events. Coming to India. Every sport in India is governed by an individual authority 
and lacks centralized legislation for governing all sporting events. The organizations responsible for their respective sporting events are autonomous bodies recognized by the government of India. Those involved in the development of sports in India are mainly the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, NYAS, the Olympic Association, IOA, Indian Olympic Association, the State Olympic Associations, National Sports Federations, NSF, and the Sports Authority of India, SAI. The autonomous bodies govern the sporting events and are further controlled by the policies of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. Now, each sport is governed by an individual authority that is a federation that exists state-wise and is affiliated to the national federation of that particular sport. The lack of a centralized legislation to govern all sporting events has given room for autonomous bodies to mushroom and then seek recognition. The policies of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports are adopted by these bodies. Now the MYAs, that is the ministry, is responsible for the creation of necessary infrastructure, development and promotion of sports in India. Now SAI, that is the Sports Authority of India, though it's, a regist though it's registered as a society under the Societies Registrations Act, it is actually an agency of the Ministry for Sports that works towards sporting talent, nurturing that talent, training, developing such talent, besides other objectives that are aimed at betterment of sports in India. Now, if you just see these flashes of certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, visuals that you get, nothing much just for you to gain an idea. And also, I assumed that if you have some visuals coming in during my talk, it might not put you to sleep and might keep you awake throughout the one hour. So therefore, I decided to have a couple of slides coming in. Now, the rules and regulations of the IOA regarding membership uh, rights of a sports person, state associations, national federations, they're all followed in its strictest sense. Therefore, all states and national federations of various sports come under IOA. The role of the government is to overlook and assist. The Executive Council of the IOA selects sports persons for international events after conducting competitions to determine the best. The power to recognize or de-recognize a state federation or a certain sport based on the support of the International Olympic Committee is a cause for grievance of many. It's been alleged that if the IOA, that is the Indian Olympic Association, is unhappy with the constitution or the executive, executive council of the state federation, or some of them refuse to toe the line of the IOA, or that their like-minded people have not, been, have not occupied the seats in the state federation, the IOA then writes to the IOC, that's the International Olympic Committee, so as to debar these associations. This unhealthy situation affects the quality of sports person chosen. Now in the matter of the IOA, that's the Indian Olympic Association versus Union of India, in the Delhi High Court, this was a 2014 judgment, uh, uh, 2014 matter, the judgment came about uh, at about 2010. Now what, the, uh, what they specifically stated was that, um, Aid or recognition is not a one-way street. Now I'll pause here. It's extremely important what the Delhi High Court said. Aid or recognition is not a one-way street. The reason being, now the IOA wants to state that we are independent. Therefore, we cannot have uh, the government deciding what we do. Therefore, the court stated that you can't have recognition and it can't be a one-way street. Why uh, the court had to observe this was you can't have a private body deciding what they do entirely under the name and guise of India. Now, if we are now if they're going to represent India, obviously the government should have a say. So the courts also held that the central government's legitimate right to recognize these sporting bodies for the purpose of the use of explanation India, expression India enabling national sports teams sponsored by NS, uh, NSF and IOA to in turn use the appellation carried with it 
the right to insist that certain basic standards are followed the right to grant or withhold the recognition is also the right to spell out conditions for the grant made and it's undoubtedly the case because of travel expenditure assistance of procurement of equipment would be aid apart from the use of state resources such as stadia customs duty waiver for the importation of equipment facilitation coordination during international events etc apart from the olympic federations there are non olympic sports federations that are directly affiliated to their respective international federations for instance the bcci now the board of control for cricket in india is affiliated to the icc all these sports federations are bodies registered under the societies registrations act and are recipients of government aid directly or indirectly the financial assistance in case of say a, a national sports federation for example the badminton association of india they directly get assistance indirect assistance in the form of tax benefits or whatever that would be the case of the bcci so the national sports federations are governed and regulated by guidelines and regulations issued by the ministry of youth affairs and sports it's pertinent to note that the area of sports falls within the prerogative of the state list under entry 33 of list 2 of the 7th schedule now that basically covers cinema uh, theater entertainment and sports hence the regulation of sporting events are the subject matter of state regulations however the multiplicity of laws that might be applicable for regulation of sporting events makes it improbable to have one legislation to cover all aspects of sports it is thus left to the independent sports federations to govern their respective sporting events these federations in compliance with the international affiliate formula the rule they formulate the rules and regulations and are granted recognition as per the national sports development code of india 2011 this code further governs the conduct of the nsf by exercising control over their financial assistance prior to the national Dev sports development code the guidelines for assistance to national sports federations framed by the union of india governed the recognition and dispensation of funds to the ns uh, the national sports federations along with determining the tenure of the office bearers of the federations these guidelines were under challenge before the delhi high court in narinder batra basically union of in india uh, in this matter in against union of india um this was uh, for violating the io ioc's charter ioc's charter is something the ioa here will have to follow now this was the challenge the high court rejected the challenge and held that the guidelines were not in violation of the ioc's charter and they were binding and enforceable which means that the code which the government has imposed the high court held that it's binding and it's en uh, enforceable where after the union of india formulated national sports development code the national sports development code enunciates the role and responsibility of the ministry the sports federations and sai the code restores the limits of uh, on the duration of the tenure of the or office bearers of the ioa and the state federations which are recognized annually the ministry grants recognition to sports federations and it's also empowered to re derecognize them by virtue of the said recognition and based on the conditions imposed by the ministry grants are awarded to these federations furthermore the said code in in the said code the government recognizes ioa and the state federations as public authority under the right to information act the this national sports development code of 2011 was challenged by the indian olympic association before the delhi high court the that is uh, the challenge was twofold one that the code is beyond the legislative competence of the parliament and the second is that its provisions are violative of the ioa's right guaranteed under article 14 and 191 c and 21 of the constitution the recognition of the national sports federation 
and the IOA and other sports organizations under the code were made subject to certain provisions. One amongst them was adherence to limits on the duration of tenure of office bearers of the IOA and all recognized NSX. The reason why all of this was necessary was is that you had these powerful people holding on to these posts, uh, these posts in these state federations forever and controlling it completely and therefore manipulating and uh, siphoning off funds and therefore there was the need to have some kind of a limit on the duration of the office bearers. The Delhi High Court upheld the code on the ground that the subject matter of the code in terms of regulation of sports federations falls within entry 97 of list 1 to the 7th schedule of the constitution, which means under the last provision, basically, whatever is not there in list 2 or 3 would fall within this. So what the court basically meant was that you can't state that it comes under list two, which comes, which has uh, sports under it and therefore it stayed. What they meant was that these do not come under sports per se. This would be more with respect to the competence and the functioning of certain federations and therefore it would come within list one under 97. Furthermore, the tenure of restrictions imposed in this case were upheld and found to be not in violation of Article 14, 19 or 21 of the Constitution. These restrictions can and are insisted upon as a part of public interest in the efficient and fair administration of the state federations. In this matter, the court had observed sports administration in this country appears to have reached depths from where neither sporting bodies nor states seem to care any longer for the successive generations or the sporting future. Reform is to be introduced urgently by the state. Sports administrations appear to be mired in power play where money, influence, the chicanery and the play a dominant part and those who have participated in competitive sports at some stage are given a token representation at best or mostly marginalized. As the cliche goes, the state of sports is in a lockjaw where roughly 1.2 billion people have to rest content with a harvest of medals so meager as to be surpassed by just one individual like Michael Phelps. The London Olympics saw India notch up a tally of six medals. This averages one medal for roughly every 207 million inhabitants. So it was very strongly worded. Nevertheless, it was needed. Apart from the code, the sports legislation in India is majorly governed and regulated by the national sports policy. There was one in 84 and then in 2001. Then SAI, the Sports Authority of India. There is one sports broadcasting law in India. Then the anti-doping agency. Then the IOA, that's the Indian Olympic Association. Then the national sports policy aims at the integration of sports with educational curriculum, development of adequate sports, uh, adequate sports facilities, and achieving excellence in national and international sports, uh, sporting events. A draft of the national sports policy of 2007 relied on observations of the United Nations, and therefore they brought about that. Now, recently, the state of Mizoram had declared sport as an industry recognizing its interlink with other sectors. Now, recognition of sports as an industry, now it was very well thought out. I think it was a great strategy because recognition of sports as an industry will attract the participation of private corporations, thereby increasing the revenue generated by the sports federations. It also enhances the grant for special schemes, tax rebates, subsidies, which are similar to other industries. I think a lot of people can learn from Mizoram and figure out a way as to how different states can operate in the same way. The government has been highlighting the need for bringing about reforms in management and governance of sports so as to yield better results and therefore the National Sports Development Bill in 2011 came about. Immediately after the 2010 Commonwealth Games, the corruption details that emerged made the government of India seem to see the need to bring about a national sports development legislation. And the government realized that in the absence of strict regulations in India, 
in the Indian sports organizations, a lack of transparency and a lack of professionalism in the administration would be the result. Though the bill was laid out in 2011 with the aim to increase transparency in the sports administration and to open up sports administration in India to public scrutiny, it needs to be seen whether the bill sees the light of the day. The bill of 2011 was revised and another bill came about, National Sports Development Bill in 2013, and it was published inviting public comments. Now the bill contemplated, amongst other things, the recognition and accreditation of national sports federations, constitution of an appellate sports tribunal with exclusive jurisdiction to try disputes relating to sports. However, disputes with regards to Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, Asian Games, and other events organized by international sports federations were left to the jurisdiction of, of the CAS, which is the uh, court in uh, Switzerland. It also contemplated establishments of an athletes commission for the uh, sports federations. Now, apart from the National Sports Development Bill of 2013, the government of India also intended to enact the Prevention of Sporting Fraud Bill of 2013. Now, this bill intended to define sporting fraud as an offense and prescribed appropriate punishment for the same. The bill also made offenses committed by companies or associations of individuals liable for punishment. All these offenses punishable under this bill could be tried by any court which is not inferior to the Metropolitan Magistrate or a Judicial Magistrate of first class. Now, this bill was criticized for being violative of federal structure of the constitution because sports is the prerogative of the state legislature and usual under the entry 33 of list, uh, list 2, which we already dealt with. Now, both these bills, they have not been enacted. Now, the reason this came about was the need because we do not have a system in our a criminal justice system to bring about any of uh, uh, you know uh, events with respect to uh, maybe uh, betting or spot fixing. So the prevention of sporting fraud bill of 2013, it intended to curb the menace of betting and spot fixing in sporting events. The prominent case of betting in India is Shrishant. Now, the BCCI as per its anti-corruption code as it then existed, held him guilty of corruption and imposed a life ban on him. This was challenged by the Supreme Court in Shrishant versus BCCI in 2019. Now, in an appeal um, agreed by the decision of the Kerala High Court, he had gone first to the Kerala High Court and then come up to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court partially allowed the appeal and lifted the life ban and asked the BCCI to reconsider the quantum of punishment and now, of course, we are all aware as to what the quantum is. All of this is brought about only because our criminal system does not have any specific section wherein you can bring them about for betting or spot fixing, and therefore this is required. Similarly, the draft National Code for Good Governance in Sports of 2017 was formulated by the Union of India to enunciate the basic universal principles of good governance, ethics, fair play, etc. It was rejected by the IOA, fearing its suspension from the International Olympic Committee because of government interference in the National Olympic Committee. Now, an important aspect of the draft code of 2017 is the power granted to the Board of National Olympic Committee, that's the IOA, to create and appoint an independent sports dispute resolution committee for the purpose of providing an independent dispute resolution mechanism to the state federations. An appeal from the, uh, the, the dispute resolution committee could lie before the CAS in Switzerland. The memorandum and rules and regulations of the Indian Olympic Association prescribes dispute settlement procedure. Now, as for the articles and the rules and regulations, it requires that the state federations, Olympic associations, union territories, associations, all of them are affiliated to the IOA to include in their constitution that the unresolved disputes to be settled by the arbitration commission of the IOA and surrender the rights of seeking redressal in any court of law. Furthermore, they also have certain articles wherein appeal against the decision of the arbitration commission will lie before the CAS. 
Now, these administrative bodies deal with the matters regarding general administration of these sporting events. Sports now includes comprehensive player rights, broadcasting rights, franchisee rights, etc. Now, every sports authority has its own dispute resolution mechanism to deal with disputes. In a dispute involving a player, the respect of sports federation is also part of the adjudicating body thus violating the basic principles of natural justice. There is a need for a centralized independent authority to adjudicate upon the disputes arising between player and the bodies. The government is, an, government is in an attempt to establish an independent adjudicating body intended to constitute an Indian Court of Arbitration for Sports in 2011. In furtherance of the same, it appointed former Supreme Court Judge of India, uh, Justice Lakshman. However, there's no information as to what happened to the constitution of the same, because this could have been path breaking. Had we had a system where similar to the CAS, we have an Indian uh, court for arbitration here. Matters go to, uh, go to Indian Arbitration Center directly. The matters are resolved in a couple of days. And any appeal against that could go to the CAS Switzerland. Unfortunately, none of us know what happened to this. This could have been a significant development in our country had this taken off. The need for an Indian CAS is absolutely essential. The term duration of the life of a sports person with respect to their career is all very brief. Any dispute requires to be resolved in a few days. Therefore, to make a player move committees, appeals, then go to courts, I think it's cruel. Now, the Indian judiciary has played an active role in the formulation of guidelines and establishing precedents to fill the gap created by the lack of sports legislations in India. Some of the important judicial decisions that have helped recognize sports law in India are as follows. Now, I think I'll first talk about the uh, Z Telefilms, which, was, uh, which all of us know about. Z Telefilms versus Union of India, which is popularly known as the BCCI case. In this BCCI case, Z Telefilms um, had uh, basically in this matter that considered to be it has been considered to be the defining moment in India Indian sports law. The court in this case recognized the arbitrary action of a private body, that's the BCCI, wherein BCCI terminated the broadcasting rights of the petitioner. Now, the challenge was brought under Article 32 of the Indian Constitution and the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under Article 32 is limited to the challenges of the state action leading to the frustration of the rights of the petitioner. Now, in order for a challenge under Article 32, if it has to be sustained, it is necessary to prove that the respondent was a state as defined under Article 12. Now, the court ruled that BCCI did not constitute a state within the ambit of Article 12 even though the functions of the BCCI are akin to the public duties or state functions, which is considered an important element in, the identif in identifying a state. However, the court made further observations regarding the remedy available for the petitioner. It said that it does not mean that the violator of the right would go spot free merely because it or he is not a state. Under the Indian jurisprudence, there's always a just remedy for violation of a right of a citizen. Though the remedy under Article 32 is not available, an aggrieved party can always seek a remedy under the ordinary course of law or by, if, by way of a writ petition under Article 226 of the Constitution, which is much wider than Article 32. Therefore, despite holding that BCCI is not a state, it practically gave an opening stating that you can't come under Article 32, but you can go under 226. Now, the Murugan case, which Murugan versus Fencing Association is extremely important, which is also referred by Government of India quite often. The Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports in their dossier for the International Olympic Committee on Guidelines and Good Governance in sports bodies of 2010 refers to this decision of the Supreme Court in Murugan's case, which recognized the significance of sports and welfare of sports persons. This case refers to the election to the post of the president, the Indian Olympic Association. 
the court in this case made significant observations regarding the welfare of the sports persons. Um, the Union of India should take greater interest in organizing sports, both for national and international purposes. Sports have a role to play in building up good, good citizens. That aspect should be kept in view. We have a feeling that while a lot of money is allocated for the purpose of improvement of sports, the result has been considerably poor and deceptive. We hope and trust that in this aspect of criticism heard from everywhere in this country, and that this should also be given due consideration. Now, besides this, a very important judgment would also be the Cricket Association of Bihar versus the Board of Control for Cricket in India. Now, in this matter, the BCCI had constituted a probe committee consisting of two former judges of Madras High Court. The Cricket Association of Bihar filed a PIL before the Bombay High Court challenging the probe committee. Now, the BCCI contended that the, petitioner, that the petition is not maintainable under 226 because BCCI is not a state. The court, however, recognized that the Apex Court in the Z Telephones case had observed that though BCCI is not a state under Article 12, it was amenable to the jurisdiction of the High Court under 226. So it further held that the constitution of the probe committee illegal and ultravise and the rules and regulations of the BCCI, it set us aside. So the BCCI approached the Supreme Court through by way of an SLP. The Supreme Court, through its order dated, uh, I think sometime in 2015, um, ordered the constitution of a Mudgal committee to look into the allegations like fraud and match fixing, fixing and betting. Thereafter, in its order uh, in around 2016, the court accepted the report submitted by the Mudgal committee and constituted the Loda committee to determine and award appropriate punishment based on the Mudgal committee report. Now, the Loda committee report was directed to be implemented and upon its failure, the BCCI uh, president uh, was uh, removed from the post. Now, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, that's the government, versus the Cricket Association of Bengal. In this, there was a very interesting line passed by uh, the court. It said that the airwaves are public property. Now, why the court mentioned all of this was the question here under consideration was whether the cricket organization had the right to grant exclusive telecast rights to a private agency rather than to Doordarshan. This case came in the backdrop of the economic policy at that point of time where private media had entered in the arena. Now, the, uh, the Supreme Court had held that the government has no monopoly on the electronic media under Article 19.1a, and a citizen has the right to telecast and broadcast to the viewers through electronic media, however they prefer it. It observed that the state monopoly on electronic media is not mentioned under Article 19.2, and therefore it said that airwaves are uh, not, uh, basically airwaves are public property. Now, um, how much time do we still have, Trilipa? You may continue, ma'am. No problem. Okay, have sufficient. Fine. All right, fine. Um, so since we have some time, I'll just speak about a couple of um, sports jurisdictions, maybe in US and uh, in um, Australia and UK, just a few lines before I go to the final uh, aspect of it. Now, legislations and probably um, in other countries, um, they're very limited and formulated by a few jurisdictions to regulate certain aspects of sports and not the sporting event per se. The legislations provide a general regulatory framework by which a central regulatory body is established to supervise the functions of all the sports federations. For, an exam for instance, the Australian Sports Commission and the United States Olympic Committee. Now in the United States, the sports law is roughly divided into three categories, which is amateur sports, professional sports, and international sports. So there's no substantive federal legislation to regulate sports per se, but the Amateur Sports Act takes care of that area, recognizes certain uh, rights of athletes, and provides a dispute resolution mechanism. The United States Olympic Committee is also given recognition under this act. Uh, the uh, each sporting event, uh, the national governing body is chartered under the U.S. Olympic Committee and establishes rules for selecting teams, promote competitions, etc. Now, with respect to professional sports, 
contract and contractual principles will govern the relationship between the player and the team owner. In Australia, the Australians had recently enacted the Controlled Sports Act of 2019, I think sometime last year. But this was more with respect to dangerous sports to regulate the conduct of certain combat and high risk sport events and to promote health and safety of controlled sports wherein contestants which involved high risk sporting events such as mixed martial arts, uh, arts or whatever, all of that would be governed by the Controlled Sports Act. This act mandates recognition of controlled sports organization and register itself under the act. Now in the UK, a government body called the UK Sport is responsible for managing and distributing all the funds with respect to sports. It regulates sports clubs through its own national governing bodies. Now the sports, um, sports legislations exist with a primary objective to promote the development of sports and its infrastructure. The extent of regulation of each sporting event is left to the organization registered with the commissioner or the registrar as the case may be under the specific legislation. Now, if we have to think about how private bodies have all along manipulated, I think I would probably have to bring about what Kapil Dev did a couple of decades ago. Now, what Kapil Dev did was similar to what I, I think this generation will know only the IPL, but most of us know Kapil Dev had brought about um, a basically a, a Premier League wherein players were brought about from different countries and all of that. Now, I think they had a setup with Z. Uh, that was probably why uh, uh, Z was uh, cut off by BCCI. Now, what Kapil Dev did was brought several players in. But then what BCCI did very smartly was did not give them access to any of the stadium, uh, stadia all over, all over the country, did not give them access to um, uh, maybe broadcasting. Um, so Z still had it. But then what they did was they confined them to one particular stadium alone. And they also had threat mechanisms. For example, they would say all those players who are going to play in that league will not be considered for the state or the nation to represent India or they cannot represent it, uh, represent their particular state. Now, these are all threats and whereby ultimately you, um, you're able to strangle anybody who wants to come up. So it was whoever is the more powerful would then strangle the other one who's trying to come up. Therefore, giving extreme power in one's hands has always been wrong. Speaking from a personal perspective where I have seen where all of us in in our college days when we had to represent our state and go about we have signed blank forms we have just been asked to sign things which we did as children we didn't know what we had to do but these were all ultimately taken by the state bodies wherein they were getting so many grants which were all eaten up none of us would get our shoes or our coats or our you know jerseys or whatever Slowly it's changed, a lot of it is coming in, but even in Bangalore, even recently, um, I will not name the sport or the people, but this is how it goes. Now there's a lot of funding that comes from the International Federation to the local federation, that is Indian, and then to the local federation. Now the amount, if say 20 crores comes in for that particular competition to be held in Bangalore, Ultimately, only about two crores will reach that uh, the person, wherein that is utilized to um, put up all the players and star hotels and all of that, and for the uh, organizing of the events. Even the Kantirava Stadium had rains, heavy rains, and the entire port was flooded. It was irrelevant. 20 crores where it went, we will all never know. See, this is the problem and therefore the government is trying to come up with guidelines to set these things right. But the, I, but the IOA continuously keeps approaching the courts. Fortunately, the courts have held that the government does have a right to bring about some guidelines. Now, the IOA had, of course, tried to, um, I think, debar us for almost 14 months. But then it was, it was um, uh, you know, brought back. So, um, I think... At a certain point of time, once the government is very clear with legislation, then everything else will fall in place. Um, 
though efforts have been made in india to formulate regulations a comprehensive enactment of legislation is necessary a sports commission like if some if a sports commission is established like in other jurisdictions it could help curb the menace of corruption growing in multiple sports authorities registered under the societies registration act the existing policies or guidelines barely meet the requirement to promote or protect the interests of athletes hence it's necessary to formulate a comprehensive legislation to that effect an independent adjudicating body is it's it's the immediate need of the hour especially to curb the menace created by sporting organizations whereby athletes are suspended or banned arbitrarily without recourse to speedy remedy the importance of speedy remedy can be studied in the backdrop of the sarita devi case in 2014 in the asian games in south korea i'm sure all of us will remember this sarita devi entered the semi finals this was a, a match against one of the koreans park jina i think that was the name she was handed a defeat verdict though she had rained heavy blows on her opponent now all of us were shell shocked that she was decided as the loser she refused to accept the bronze medal and handed it over the, to the silver medalist she was banned from participating for one year by the international boxing association and the decision of the aiba disciplinary committee could not be appealed thus virtually ending her career now an amendment to the constitution is necessary to make the subject matter of sports to be brought under the prerogative of the parliament which currently lies under the state list nt33 now what happened in the sarita devi case was she did move the delhi high court she moved the delhi high court but the indian boxing association um uh, very conveniently stated that since it was disciplinary proceedings therefore no appeal would lie and therefore she could not go to the cas which is wrong because all of these federations come under the olympic association which in turn goes to the cas so therefore to state that since this is a disciplinary action she cannot appeal it it would be wrong of course during the pendency of that matter before the delhi high court ultimately even she decided to withdraw the uh, the uh, basket uh, the uh, boxing federation also withdrew therefore nothing much was left but the point was when she got that bronze medal she should have ideally probably gotten the uh, uh, the gold medal she was deprived of it she was really old by then and she was deprived of it at a stage where uh the justice system would take too long for her to get some kind of a relief and therefore she just left it aside i have no idea why the the system of marking uh the point system in a boxing match is not very similar to that of you know wrestling or any other sport wherein you get the point system immediately one or five whatever it comes up immediately the moment one move of one move of yours is made but in boxing you have no idea so the points whether each blow of hers there would be no point entry and you would never know and that's how sarita devi lost her case because none of any blows of hers went down to the paper and then it's very convenient because the uh, the authorities there said that the judge's decision is final and it cannot be challenged so the judges know that their decision cannot be challenged and therefore they let away spot free therefore even in competitive events at least if it's if it's these separate uh, bouts wherein you have the boxing federations in the us organized private bouts it's different but in the olympic uh, uh, in the olympic matches or in the asia i think what they must do is have a system where it's transparent have the system of point system being reflected i think india could raise that up at any point of time now um coming back to the amendment which would be necessary if sports is brought it basically lies still under state list under 33 now if it is brought under the prerogative of the parliament and the national sports development bill of 2013 and the prevention of sporting fraud bill 2013 which has been in abeyance will finally be enacted to establish the necessary independent adjudicatory bodies the shri shant case which was which dealt with the bcci anti corruption code 
was because of lack of criminal sanctions under the existing criminal justice system. Would be, so therefore, otherwise he would be tried by the magistrate and it would be possible under the Prevention of Sporting Fraud Bill 2013. Now, icons like Dravid, Gopi Chand, they've all invested in recognizing talent and shaping them. The Gold Quest initiative by Geet Sethi and Prakash Padukone to spot talent and fund such individuals so as to achieve gold medals for our country is noteworthy. If such initiatives are given prominence by the government and corporates are brought in to help, the code will achieve its purpose. Amongst the government's initiatives, the Kelo India has been promoting significance of sports in developing team spirit and analytical thinking, growing to the grassroot level. This was introduced basically to revive the sports culture in the grassroot level and identify talented players. So the Ministry of Sports has organized school games as part of the Kalo movement. Now, in the case of Rahul Mehra, um, which was, uh, I think, in the year 2010, the court had passed an interim order as a result of which the extension given to the federations on their recognition up to this September, it was withdrawn. Now, this is a case that is right now pending before the Delhi High Court, and this could determine the future of sports law in India, not just with respect to the code, but I think the government will gain a lot by this and go further probably to formulate a more seasoned uh, uh, code. The petitioner had alleged that the IOA was attempting to de-recognize many federations so as to create bodies to suit their convenience. That the Ministry of Sports had sought compliance of provisions or by the 54 state federations in two forms. They'd sent out two forms. They asked them to fill up these forms and explain whether they're following it or they're in violation of the code under several uh, of the code under several heads. Because of the de-recognition, right now SAI is in charge temporarily. Now, in view of this COVID situation, the government has assumed that, all right, let's give them an extension until such time that they figure it out. But the Delhi High Court came down heavily, I think, in July. Um, they stated that um, whatever interim orders they have passed, the government has not followed it. And therefore, the government immediately de-recognized all of these uh, state federations. Um, as a result of this, I think if we should be looking forth to this judgment, and if it is challenged in the Supreme Court, then that judgment, which would set and pave way for sports legislations in India. But for now, this is the code which we are all looking at, which could co probably govern all these other bodies which want to run it privately. Now, the Supreme Court has time and again warned the sports federations for being in violation of rules and regulations and to act in accordance with the doctrine of good faith and fairness. Now, this doctrine of good faith and fairness is what the Supreme Court has relied on whenever these parties have tried to state that they don't come within the meaning of state. The need is to combine all schemes, provisions, notifications and rules and put together a common code. So I'd like to end by stating that just before the Uniform Civil Code comes in, we hope that a Uniform Sports Code is passed. Thank you all so much. Thank you, ma'am, for throwing light on this uh, arena of sports law. I still feel that it is unexplored uh, and barely touched uh, area. Um, so with your permission, can we now move on to the Q&A session? Sure, sure. So from today onwards, we'll be having uh, only uh, the Q&A through the uh, Q&A box. So I request all the learned members to uh, post their questions through the uh, Q&A box. Uh, in fact, we already have a very good question by uh, Ms. Lata Rani. So she has this question, ma'am. Uh, please let me know about Diploma course in Sports Law. So she would like to know more about uh, the diploma the, in the sports law. Okay, okay. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, institutions, I think, in Hylian is where I had uh, done it. Uh, so you can do uh, a diploma in sports law um, through correspondence. Um, but uh, if you're able to go abroad and do it, then there's nothing like it because uh, UK, there are about uh, four to five universities which offer it, which is really good. 
Uh, but if you're going to do it in correspondence, I think um, uh, two or three uh, universities here offer it. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Biju has a question. What's the way to curb junior oblique sub junior football leagues where clubs are playing over aged players? Is this the reason why Indian football team does not see international arena? It's not just in football, it's in every sport. Um, what they do is they manipulate your, um, your uh, marks cards and uh, your uh, school entry dates and then bring in, uh, you know, older players to play in. And this happens in most of the sports. This is done with a very narrow minded and a quick fix solution because they want to show that they're winners. So they want the best and therefore they put in these kind of players who are overaged, but they want to slip them in. Um, but honestly, I think all this is going to change because they've become very strict these days. They've been getting away with it in these, um, you know, in the uh, local levels uh, because you have these sports at these district levels. You have these sports at these, um, uh, what is that, taluk level and all of that. There, they're able to manipulate it because it's still um, in the, where you, uh, you know, go through the papers in respect of, you know, it's still entries. But uh, now, as far as I know, when you come to a state, even for a junior level to be chosen, they go through a very, very stringent, uh, uh, you know, uh, verification. They One, they ask you to go and get your, um, not just the school where you study, because it's very convenient to manipulate. They uh, One is to get your... Um, where you were born and then they ask you to go back to the school where you started your kindergarten so they want a certificate from the kindergarten school that way you will not be able to manipulate because now they're all able to manipulate because they're able to state that i studied in such and such a school and give a wrong date because the school will also be in connivance with them so that's getting very difficult now but yes the problem exists it should go in a couple of years Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Shivani has a question. Uh, how to prevent casino custom in clubs and better activities? So it is not directly related, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't concern uh, uh, sports law, but um, see, gaming and betting um, comes under list two in the constitution, which would be a state list. Therefore, if we look at Karnataka, um, I think it under the police act, you will probably get um, you know, uh, the, no, the rules with respect to betting and uh, gambling and all of that. Um, since lottery does not exist in Karnataka, which is a form of uh, gambling or betting, uh, we cannot have uh, casinos and all of that. But broadly speaking, I think casinos exist only in two states in India or three, I think Goa, if you include Daman, uh, which is Union Territory, uh, Goa, I think Sikkim, skipping, uh, Sikkim has uh, casinos. Now, casinos come in with respect to getting more of international people to come in and play for an X amount or whatever. It's not been accepted, but I do recollect in Karnataka, they were planning to open up casinos in Karwar and some of the beautiful beach resorts in Dakshin Kannada. But I think they didn't go ahead with it because we don't have a proper legislation in place. And I think the government didn't want to toy with that idea until such time that it was very clear. So having said that, um, one is it's a state's decision. Two is casinos don't exist beyond Goa and Sikkim. Three is it's legal over there. Um, four is that if anything exists in Karnataka, then under the Police Act. My right, limited idea of it, yes. Thank you. In continuation of that, we have an anonymous attendee who has a question. What about esports in India? There's no legislation governing players taking part in esports matches. 2024 Olympics has even introduced this category. Okay. Uh, now, esports, again, the governance will take such a little bit of time because there's nothing in place as yet. But again, there are rules there itself. So they will provide the rules and regulations which you need to click into. So then you would have to accept their rules and regulations and participate in it. And the appeal process, again, is part of that rules and regulations. So the government of India at this point of time could not come. 
Mr. Chandrasekhar, though it doesn't look like a question, uh, he says, I think Kapil's idea of starting Indian Cricket League for talent search in cricket. As you said, the BCCI suppressed the Sex Cricket League, uh, gave birth to its child and called it as Indian Premier League. All right. Do you want to That's share right. your views? Uh, well, that was very, very unfortunate because it was very clear the haves and the have-nots. So uh, the money played an important role. And uh, that, uh, and I felt extremely bad for what Kapil Dev had done. It was, it was an excellent idea, and these people stole the idea and made something else of it completely. Uh, so it's very unfortunate. But that is exactly why I'm telling you that the government is on the right path with this code coming in and maybe future legislations. I think nobody can wag their tail. And thanks to the Supreme Court uh, and the Delhi High Court judgments and also the Bombay High Court, they have been able to interpret it in such a manner whereby it gives us the right to move the courts and get remedy as against these bodies. All right, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we have hit the last uh, fag end of this session. And uh, yes. sir, do you have a question? Uh, I think our secretary wants to speak. Sir, do you have a question? Uh, I have no questions. Anyway, I should congratulate Madam to, uh, for having uh, educated all of us in a new field of law. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ma'am, on uh, behalf of Advocates Association Bangalore, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to you for a brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all. And with this, we will be signing off today's uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much.